Section 3.2. Today we're going to learn uh, easier ways to find a determinant than just straight up cofactor expansion. So let's start with a review of cofactor expansion. If I want to find this 3 by 3 determinant, um, I'm just going to do cofactor expansion across row 1, because there's a 0 there. And so this is going to be 1, and that's in the positive spot, negative 1 to the 1 plus 1 is 2, so I'm just going to write positive 1. And then the subdeterminant I get when I cross out the row and the column that 1 live in, that's 4, negative 1, 2, negative 1. Then plus 5 times negative 1 to the 1 plus 2 is 3, so that's in the negative spot, so I'll just switch that to a minus 5. Minus 5 times the subdeterminant, 2, negative 1, 2, negative 1, plus 0 times the subdeterminant, which I'm not going to write down. So this is 1 times negative 4 minus a negative is plus 2, so that's minus 2, minus 5 times negative 2 plus 2 is 0. We'll see today that when any two rows or the columns of a matrix are the same, the determinant of that matrix is 0. So we get negative 2. Okay, next one. This is an upper triangular matrix, so I can take the determinant by multiplying the diagonal entries, 12. All right, which statements make sense? The first one, find this matrix. Okay, that matrix is staring us right in the face. So this reminds me of this comic that we used to have sitting in the, in the, um, over the microwave in the bullpen for a long time. I'll show it to you. It's at the end of these lecture notes. I thought it was funny the first time I saw it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Find X. Here it is. <laughs> okay, so it's like that. So that, that statement doesn't really make sense. Find that matrix. Well, that matrix is right there. So that one doesn't make sense. The next one, find this determinant. That makes sense. So that's going to be fine. This is a number. You can find it. The next one makes no sense because you can't take the determinant of a non-square matrix. On the second row, uh, this makes sense. Find the determinant of that matrix. So these two things mean the same thing. Two ways of saying the same thing. The next one makes no sense because you can't have, um, this needs to have, you can't have a matrix without any symbols around it. You need something there. So this one makes no sense. And then this one, it actually does make sense, but you have to interpret those outside bars as being absolute value. So this says, find the absolute value of the determinant of that matrix. So three of them make sense. All right, effect of row operations on determinants. This is what we were sort of leading up to last time with all that work with elementary matrices. And here are the results. If you scale B results by multiplying A by one row of A by a scalar, then determinant of B is K times the determinant of A. Now, the way I like to think about this is just you can pull a scalar out of any row of a determinant. Okay, so you can pull a scalar a scalar out of a row. So here, I, the, the top row, uh, 4, was a multiple of the top row. I just pulled it out. Okay, that's the easiest way to think about that one. The next one, if you want to swap two rows, you're going to introduce a minus sign. So the determinant of this matrix is negative the determinant of this matrix. And row replacement, if you recall, the row replacement operation for an elementary matrix had no effect on the determinant, and that's true in general. If you um, do a row replacement here, I uh, replaced row 2 with twice row 1 plus row 2, it will not change the determinant. And that's awesome because that's our most popular row operation is row replacement, and it won't change the determinant. So we can use these facts to um, make finding determinants much easier. Now this next comment, notation, um, notation uh, row equivalence versus equal. So when you have a statement about matrices, you want to talk about row equivalence. So for example, 1, 2, 
um, 3, 4, that's a matrix, it would be row equivalent to the matrix I get when I swap rows, 3, 4, 1, 2. They're not equal. I couldn't put an equal there because that matrix is clearly different than this one, but they're row equivalent. With determinants, you want to use equal. If you write the determinant of 1, 2, 3, 4, it wouldn't make any sense to go, oh, that's equivalent to negative the determinant. So I'm going to take that out. You want an equal sign here. This is actually equal to negative the determinant of the matrix you get when you swap the rows. And that's by property B up above. Swapping rows introduces a minus sign. So row equivalence versus equal. So in these problems here that I'm going to do on the next page, everything's going to be an equal in between, in between computations. So this first problem, imagine if we had to do this doing cofactor expansion, what a drag that would be. Because I'd have to, there are no zeros. I'd have to do three full on two by two determinants multiply by constants, um, and then add my result. Kind of a long process. However, if I can use row replacement, which I can, this is equal to, I'm going to copy down row one, one, five, three. I'm going to replace row two with negative two row one plus row two. And then I'm going to replace row three with negative two row one plus row three. And that gives me zero, negative 6, negative 5, and then 0, negative 8, negative 7. Okay. Now, now I think I'll do cofactor expansion. I mean, I could keep going till I add echelon form. If it's triangular, you can multiply the diagonal entries. But that's going to introduce a bunch of fractions, right? Because, because it is. <laughs> so, so I'm going to work... Um, smart not hard, I'm going to do cofactor expansion down this column. So this is 1, which is in the positive spot, so negative 1 to the 1 plus 1, I'll leave that off, and then my submatrix is negative 6, negative 5, negative 8, negative 7. Okay, and that's 42 minus 40, which is 2. So you can do a combination of techniques. In this next example, I'm going to try and use all three properties of, um, in theorem three, I'm going to try and use all three properties to find this determinant. Actually, four properties, because I'm going to also use cofactor expansion. So I'm going to start with cofactor expansion on row two, because that's got a lot of zeros in it. So this is going to be five times negative one to the four, and then my subdeterminant is two, six, 10, one, three, four, two, seven, 11. Whoops, that's an 11. Okay, so that is, just for fun now, I'm gonna pull a two, out of row one. Pull two out of R1. You don't have to write down what you're doing above the equal. I'm doing that for your benefit. So negative one to the fourth is one. Five times two is 10. And now I have one, three, five. One, three, four, two, seven, eleven. All right. Now, since this now I have a one up here, I can use that one to do row replacement and kill off the one below and the two below. So this is by row replacement. And remember, row replacement is not going to change the determinant. So I can do a row replacement and just have the same determinant. I'm going to leave the top row alone. If I'm add negative one times the first row to the second row, I get zero, zero, negative one. And if I multiply the top row by negative two and add it to the third row, I'm gonna get zero, one, one. Okay, now I'm gonna do a swap so that I have a triangular matrix. 
I'm going to swap rows two and three. That's going to introduce a minus sign. So I have minus 10, one, three, five, zero, one, one, zero, zero, negative one. Okay, now I've got a triangular matrix. I can take the determinant by multiplying on the diagonal. Negative 10 times negative 1 is 10. So I tried to use everything there. Row replacement, swapping, pulling a scalar out, and cofactor expansion. I guess I used five properties because I also use the fact that the determinant of a triangular matrix is the product of the diagonal entries. Okay, this next one. Given that the determinant of this matrix is 7, find the determinant of this next matrix. So the idea is to undo, um, so sort of work on this matrix to get back to this matrix and keep track of what we had to do to this matrix as we go. So I've got the determinant of this matrix here. The first thing I want to do, I think, is swap rows one and three, because I want ABC on the top row. So that's going to introduce a minus sign. So I'll have A, B, C on the top, and G, H, I on the bottom. And then in the middle, I still have 2D plus A, 2E plus B. I should have written, um, should have left myself a little bit more space, 2F plus C. Okay, now what? Uh, you might say, well, I'll pull a 2 out of row 2. And that would be bad, because you can't yet. You can eventually, but right now, there's no 2 in front of the ABC. So you cannot pull a 2 out of row 2. I want to make that very clear. You have to do this in the proper order. The first thing we need to do is get rid of this ABC. And the way we're going to do that is row replacement. I'm going to add negative row 1 to row two. So I'm going to replace row two with negative row one plus row two. That won't change the determinant because it's row replacement. So A, B, C. Now I have 2D, 2D, 2E, 2F, and GHI. Okay. Finally, I can pull a 2 out of row 2. I can do that now. So negative 2, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Okay. And now finally, the, now I have the, the, the original matrix here. And so I know that a determinant of this is 7 because that was given to me. Negative 2 times 7 is negative 14. Now you would have gotten negative 14 if you'd pulled a 2 out in this first step and then done row replacement. But it would have been wrong because the math you were doing wasn't right. So, so be careful. First get rid of the ABC on that row 2, then pull out the 2. The order matters. Okay, one more. Um, and I just should mention that there are many, many ways to compute a determinant. So, so if, um, if I pause the video right now and had you all computing this determinant, you might do it all a different way. And that's okay. As long as you're following the rules, there are different ways to get to the same result. For me, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to get make the number smaller and just pull out, pull out a 10 out of row 1. That seems like a no-brainer. So 1, 5, negative 6, negative 1, negative 4, 4, negative 2, negative 7, 9. Okay, now I'm going to do row replacement, my favorite operation, to kill off the negative 1 and the negative 2. 1, 5, negative 6. I'm going to add row 1 to row 2. 0, 1, negative 2. And then I'm going to add twice row 1 to row 3 to get 0, 3, negative 3. OK, now at this point, you could do one of two things. You could do cofactor expansion down column 1, 
because you'd only have one computation to do. Or the way I'm going to do it is I'm just going to keep going till I have echelon form. I only need to do one more row replacement and then I'll have a triangular matrix. So that's what I'm going to do. 1, 5, negative 6, 0, 1, negative 2, and then replace row 3 with negative 3 times row 2 plus row 3. 0, 0, and then let's see, negative 2 would be 6, 6 minus 3 is 3. Okay, now I've got a triangular matrix, 10 times 3 is 30. All right, so that's going to make uh, finding determinants much easier. Five properties of determinants. I've taken a bunch of theorems in your book and combined them into one big result. A is invertible if and only if the determinant of A is not zero. We saw that was true for two by two, and now it's true for any, any square matrix. And so we can add that to the bottom of the IMT because it's another result for, um, for an invertible matrix. Theorem five is the determinant of A is the determinant of A transpose. That should be no surprise because you can compute the determinant by doing cofactor expansion down any row, sorry, across any row or down any column. But the rows of A are the columns of A transpose. So that, that result makes complete sense. Theorem six is proved using elementary matrices. We saw it in some special cases, but it's true in general. Determinants multiply. The determinant of a product is the product of the determinant. Theorem seven, if you have an invertible matrix, then the determinant of the inverse is one over the determinant of the matrix. And then this last um, property doesn't have a theorem name, but we saw this in the last class. If A is an N by N matrix, and you want to scale all of A by K, not just one row, that results in um, changing the determinant by k to the n. So let's prove theorem seven, given that we have these other theorems at our disposal. So since A is invertible, A invertible, that means the inverse exists. So A inverse A is the identity. All right, we can make that statement because A is invertible. All right, so now let's take the determinant of both sides of that equation. Determinant of A inverse A is the determinant of the identity. Okay, by theorem six, the determinant of A inverse A is the determinant of A inverse times the determinant of A. And the determinant of the identity, we don't need a theorem for that. That's just all ones down the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So that's one. Okay, so now I'm kind of running out of space. So I'm going to move up here. Divide both sides by the determinant of A. This gives me determinant of A inverse is one over the determinant of A. And that's actually what I was trying to show. Furthermore, this makes sense because the determinant of A is not zero because A is invertible. Because you don't want to divide by zero since A is invertible. All right, so let's use these properties to find some determinants. So we're told here, and I think that's the last I'm going to, let's see. Let's see what else I have. Yeah, the rest are practice problems. There's only three practice problems for you. Um, let's find uh, these determinants using the fact that A and B are both four by four matrices. Determinant of A is negative one and the determinant of B is two. And in each case, I'm gonna justify how I'm getting my answer. So for A, this is determinant of A times determinant of B. All right. And so that's negative one times two, which is negative two. All right, for part B, this is determinant of B times B five times. So you can use um, theorem, what is it? Theorem six, 
to separate this out five times. That's the determinant of B times the determinant of B times the determinant of B, so on and so forth. That's the determinant of B to the fifth power. But the determinant of B is 2. 2 to the fifth is 32. Okay, determinant of 2A. This is 2 to the K times the determinant of A, where K is the number of rows or columns, the size of A. You can say size, and it's not ambiguous because the number of rows is the number of columns. In this case, K is 4 because we're told A is 4 by 4. So this is 2 to the 4th times the determinant of A, which is negative 1. So this is negative 16. Okay? Determinant of B inverse, that's an easy one. That's just 1 over the determinant of B, which is 1 half. Determinant of A transpose A. Well, let's do this slowly. This is the determinant of A transpose times the determinant of A by theorem 6. The determinant of a product is the product of the determinants. But then, determinant of A transpose is equal to the determinant of A. So this is determinant of A times the determinant of A, which is the determinant of A squared. Negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. All right, and finally, determinant of B inverse AB. Now, matrix multiplication does not commute. So you can't just write, this is not determinant. You can't just move the A's and B's around. A and then B inverse B and then say, oh, B inverse B is I. So that's just the determinant of A. Okay, it, it will be, the, the answer will be the determinant of A, but that's not the reason. That's bad reasoning. Okay, so here's how we're going to reason it. We're going to write, by theorem 6, this is determinant of B inverse. By the way, theorem 6 generalizes to any number of products. So if you have determinant of ABC, that's determinant of A, determinant B, times determinant C. So this is determinant of B inverse times determinant of A times determinant of B. Now, determinant of B inverse, by theorem 7, is 1 over the determinant of B. And then we have determinant A, determinant B. Now, these are numbers. Numbers do commute. So now I can move things around because these are just numbers. So this is determinant of A and then times uh, 1 over determinant B. times determinant B. So these guys kill each other off, and we end up with the determinant of A, which is, I've forgotten, negative 1. Okay, so that is the end of this section. Next time we'll see applications of determinant with Kramer's rule.